I know God is healing you because that's his desire, that's his will, and that's what his word says. And then when Bill got him to stand again after praying and anointing him, I was just really stunned. But it's emphysema and for a touch from God. Thank you, Father, for your healing touch in Jesus' name. There's his presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for healing my brother. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. My feet were wobbly at first, but they got stronger as I was prayed for. God just so enveloping you now with his love and his presence is on you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Thank you, Lord. Let's cause this condition. Out. In the name of Jesus. I just couldn't wait to get to church. I just loved going to church when I just sensed the presence of God around me and especially at church. Just sense the power of God there. The power of God on her. Her body's vibrating with that power. Thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Thank you, Jesus. You sense the power of God all over your body? Yes, tell us what it's like. Beautiful. Well, just, are you a Christian? Yes. yes. And how long have you had this asthma? Since I was three. I was barely able to hobble into the meeting. I was able to sprint out. And I thought, well, here's something I can't really, uh, can't really understand. That, that is the result of signs and of wonders in the name of Jesus. And we praise God for his miracle working power this day. I've lived in Mount Roskill, Auckland, New Zealand, all of my life. And I was brought up in the Depression years, and in those years, I recall going to the Mount Roskill Borough Council with a sugar bag on my back, one of those sacks that you, small sacks you can carry, in order to pick up old clothes and uh, groceries that they handed out. And that really got to me, because even at the age of seven or eight years of age, I used to think, I would hate to be poor when I grew up. And then added to that, uh, when I was around eight years of age, my younger brother, Keith, uh, contracted cancer. He was five years of age when he got this cancer, and he was dying for 18 months, and finally he passed away. But the day he died, he called his mother and father into the room, and he was looking, looking beyond uh, them. It was clear he was looking into something they couldn't see. And he, a smile came on his face, his, his, his body colour all returned for a few moments. It looked as though he was well for a moment. And then he said, Mum and Dad, I've got to leave you now. And there was a, an expression of joy on his face. It was clear he knew where he was going. Anyway, his death changed my life because my parents immediately began to search for spiritual help after his death. My mother had been a Catholic, hadn't been to church for the, to the Catholic Church for many years. So finally they ended up in a small uh, group of people, Christian people, who were very legalistic. They had a set of laws about being a Christian. Now I didn't like this. Um, I grew up from 8 then through 16 in this particular church following a set of rules. For example, I couldn't uh, listen to the radio, I couldn't uh, play sport, but I did all of those things behind my parents' back. So deception began to enter my life. Now, when I was around 16 years of age, I decided that I wanted to make this money that I was keen to make, and I thought, well, the best way would be to be a lawyer. Why a lawyer? Well, I wasn't very good with my hands. I couldn't be a carpenter. I wasn't good as an accountant uh, because I wasn't good with maths. So I decided that I would study law. So I told my mother. She was horrified. She could remember the lawyers who tempted Jesus Christ, and she said, they're a bad lot. I don't like these lawyers, and I don't think you should be one. But anyway, I went on to university, and, the, and in the next five years, I studied law. Now, when I started university, I stopped going to church. And as I was at university, I used every available moment of my spare time to spend time in the library finding out or trying to prove there was no God, because I want to prove I was right. God did not exist. I didn't like this sort of legalism I'd been in. My mother never stopped praying for me. 
Around 19 years of age, I went to a dance. In those days, of course, you could go to a dance without having the police or the riot squad. You know, today there's so, many, so much violence, but in those days, dances were respectable affairs. And I asked the girl to dance with me, and I found she could dance beautifully. And I fell in love with her, began to take her out, and found that she was an Anglican or an Episcopalian, and not only that, she was a Sunday school teacher. And, and so, for two years we courted. I just couldn't get Pat out of my mind. I asked her to marry me. I'd set up as a lawyer. I'd only been young in practice, 22 years of age. We're not allowed to advertise in our country, so I joined every committee that I could join in order to get known. And then, as we came towards marriage, the vicar said to me he would not marry me unless I went through some form of instruction in the Anglican faith. I only wish today that churches would insist on something like that before they married people willy-nilly. Anyway, for six weeks, every Saturday morning, I attended at that pastor's home, and every morning it ended in an argument. For I would argue about the Word of God. In fact, he would often say, Bill, I don't know the answer to your question. For goodness sake, go and see the bishop. Well, I didn't want to see any bishop. I wanted to get married, so I was back again next Saturday. After eight weeks, he gave up and said, I'll marry you. Now, during these, this period, I had determined, of course, to start in practice. I'd qualified as a lawyer, ready to start. So one day I was admitted as a barrister and solicitor. The next day I opened my practice. But, of course, you've got to get clients. And so I'd prepared for this by joining every committee that would have me, whether it be a school committee, soccer committee, a young people's committee, an old people's committee, whatever it was. I'd get on the committee and they'd say, well, what are you doing? What's your, what, 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 what's your uh, livelihood? I'd say, I'm a, a lawyer. Or they would say, I know a friend who needs a lawyer. So I'd get another client, you see. So that was how I began to get clients because we were not allowed to advertise. So my practice began to prosper and thus I went on into marriage. My dear old mum, she prayed for me. In fact, she died about three months after we were married. Uh, suddenly she died in hospital. About six months after our marriage, my having told Pat, by the way, at, uh, on our honeymoon, that I had no intention of ever going to church again, maybe once or twice, but never regularly. About six months after our marriage, one Sunday morning as Pat prepared to go to church, I remember very well, she's getting uh, dressed and she turns to me and she says, Bill, why don't you come along to church this morning. You don't have to come into the church service, but after church they're going to elect a committee. Well, when I heard that word committee, I thought, well, yes, I'd like to be on that committee, but I'm not going to church. She said, you don't have to go to church, uh, Bill. It's after church. So she finished her dressing and off she went. And over the next 30 minutes I wrestled with this problem. I didn't want to go near that church, but here was an opportunity. So finally, Greed got the better of me. I dressed, showered, and off as I went off to church, at least the building behind the church. And here I am in this building within about five minutes. I find I'm elected to something called a vestry. I'd never heard of a vestry, didn't know what a vestry was. After the meeting, the vicar comes up to me. Now, he's a, he was a very large man called Canon Small, of all things. And he greeted me. He said, pleased to meet you, young man. Um, uh, we'll welcome you in our church, and of course we expect to see you on Sunday. I said, I don't plan to be in church on Sunday. He looked uh, rather surprised, but he said, you've got to come to church if you're on the vestry. So I went away and I read the Anglican rule book, so to speak, being a lawyer, and I found that to be an Anglican you had to go to church twice a year as a minimum and take communion, Christmas and Easter. So I went back to the next vestry meeting. He said, have you changed your mind? I said, you will see me at Christmas and Easter. Well, he never said much. He was a wise man. But gradually I got interested in what they did in church. I mean, they talked about it in the um, vestry meeting. I thought, well, I'll go along and watch. So I got at the back of the church, but when they all went forward for communion, I went too. And that's really how I became involved. I'd taken communion in the other little church, so I knew what it was about. Well, the years began to roll by, and very rapidly I was elected first onto the synod, that's the governing body of the church, and then I went on to the um, standing, uh, not the standing committee, the uh, uh, stewardship council of the church. I became chairman of the stewardship council of the whole diocese, travelled with the bishop around 80 parishes, became a confidant of our bishop, uh, was an advisor to him, on a special committee advising him, 
And so I became an important man, I thought, in the church. And I liked being in the Anglican church. I felt it was respectable and uh, gave me status in the community. And, uh, you know, I put a lot of time in on committees and so forth. And in fact, I didn't really believe too much about God. But I thought, you know, if God exists, with all the work I'm doing for him, he's really lucky to have me on his side. You know, sometimes we can work so hard, even for somebody we don't know about, that we can think we're doing them a favour. My children came along, girl, boy, girl, boy, in that order. Well, that was what I planned, you see. I was one of those positive mental attitude people who thought, well, if I wanted something, I could have it. I mean, the fact that Pat had something to do with it, I guess, was incidental, but I just took the view that it was just as I planned. They were born well and healthy, as it should be. At the age of nine years, I took my son Paul, when he was nine years of age, to our Stanmore Bay beach home. Now, our beach home was about 30 miles from Auckland, and every Friday night it was our practice to spend the weekend there, so we would go down. On this particular occasion, something happened that changed Paul's life, and it was this, and changed my life. I used to let that home out to anybody who wanted it. It might be ski instructors took their girlfriends there for a high weekend, may have been a member of the clergy wanted to use it, but whoever wanted it, they had it. I didn't understand about the powers of darkness. And Paul, my son, went into that bedroom that Friday night, the light wasn't on, and suddenly he came out screaming. We'd only just arrived in the house. As he shot through our lounge, he was screaming blasphemies, the like I never thought a nine-year-old boy would know. He disappeared up the back hill. It took us an hour to find him, and when we found him, he was a totally different boy. He was weeping, and then he became rebellious, and he was changed. And at 10, the school called me down and said, why is he so different from his sisters? We just can't handle him. At 11, Paul asked me, am I adopted? At 12, Pat told me that if I kept Paul out of jail till he was 20, she'd give me a medal. Yes, for most of my youth, I can uh, recall having a rebellion against my father. Uh, when he would suggest I do something, I would automatically do the opposite. And uh, I had a tremendous anger uh, when he would direct me to do something and punish me for doing it. Well, I worked hard to keep that boy out of jail. I did everything. I worked with him in his schoolwork. I tried to encourage him. I coached him as best I could. I did all the things that I thought a father should do. Well, he passed his school certificate exams, which was fine. Then he went on in due course, passed his university entrance exams. Bit of a struggle, but he, was, he got through. But his rebellion grew and our relationships grew worse and worse. And finally, at the age of 16, I will remember, we were in our lounge and we had a, an argument. And I recall one particular instance when uh, uh, he instructed me to do something and this anger just welled up with inside me. I'd had enough um, of the situation, so I just sort of lashed out in my anger um, and uh, hit my father. And, and when I got off the floor, I thought he'd knock every tooth out of my head. And I thought, I'll fix you. You need a, pa a type of military training. You know, put you in the army, it'll do you good. Well, he was too young for the army, but there was a paramilitary type organization called um, Outward Bound. So with some difficulty, I got him into that, and he spent about nine weeks on the usual course. He didn't write to me, he wrote once to his mother, but when he came back after that and stepped off the train at the Auckland Railway Station, I knew he was different. For when he stepped off, I could see he was about eight kilograms lighter. But when he opened his mouth, I knew he was lean and mean. It had done nothing for him. Well, he went on. He said he was going to go to university. I said, go down to the local university. He said, no. He said, I'm going to the city of Dunedin, 500 miles away. I said, why there, Paul? He said, just to get as far away from you as I can. And you know, this hurt me deep down because I was trying to help this boy. Well, he went down there and the first year wasn't too bad, but the second year, by then his sister Jan, his older sister, was also there studying dietetics. And she used to call me up and maybe on a Sunday morning and say, well, he's alive, he's in hospital, he's had an accident or some other major problem. And I began to realize that this boy could be on a path to destruction. I mean, he could die any time from a major accident or something. 
But many other things were happening too by now in my life. You see, I had achieved my ambitions in terms of money. My law practice was very successful. I'd started a home and development company which grew into building 15,000 homes. And uh, I'd gotten my Rolls Royce, got my large yacht, had my large home situated on 10 hectares of land in the centre of our city, a swimming pool, tennis court, everything that opened and shut. Could travel anywhere. I had made my pile. I was successful financially. But inside of me, I was empty. I knew something was wrong. My friends were all getting their divorces. My marriage was coming apart. During these years, Billy Graham visited our country on two occasions, six years apart. When he made the call for people to go forward, I felt that's not for me, that's an emotional thing. And I watched some of my friends who had accompanied me go forward in response to the appeal. And I thought, what would people think of me? Member of the Synod, member of the Vestry, chairman of the Stewardship Council, advisor to the Bishop. What would they think of me going forward and making that decision? So I didn't. But on the way out, both times, I felt a great sadness come over me as though I'd missed something. I remember I was chairman of a group of churches, they had, by a chairman of a committee, I should say, of a group of churches in our district. They met together to see what they could do as a group. And I used to be chairman, listen to them all, and there was one man there who never said very much. But when he said something, it was worth listening to. And I remember well one night as he walked out of the house, out of this very house, he stood at the front door. It was just on midnight. He turned to me and he said, Bill, you know, unless you're born again, you'll never understand the Word of God. I bridled. I said, oh, I can read the Word of God? Of course I can. But I knew I was lying. I'd tried to read the Bible many times. What happened? I'd read one verse, second verse, third verse. I couldn't remember the first verse I'd read. It, it didn't make sense to me. But that man's remark stuck deep within me. And so we come to a point, 15 years ago, my marriage is getting worse. Pat and I are beginning to discuss the question of separation. She's seeking other help and advice. My children, problems, particularly with Paul and rebellion. The practice and business, prospering. But I knew that I was getting worse in some senses. I couldn't understand it suicidal thoughts were coming into my mind. I mean, it was ridiculous. I would drive down the road and think if I drove into another car, I could end it all. I couldn't understand why I was getting these thoughts, but I knew I was very unhappy inside. And then, one day my daughter Maria, who was then 14, came along and said, Dad, why don't you come down to the local Anglican church? There's a, an American businessman going to speak there. I said, I'm not interested, but you can go if you want to. There was an old man speaking at church called Enoch, and he was a millionaire. He'd made a lot of money uh, selling turkeys. And the way he spoke was just so special. He really knew God, and he spoke from his personal experience. And I just wanted to know God the way that man did. When Maria came back, her face was aglow. I was reading my newspaper. She said, Dad, you should have been there. He gave his testimony. Well, I knew what a testimony was. I'd been in a church, they gave testimonies. Oh, yes, Maria. And then she said, Dad, but he was a multi-millionaire. At that time, I wasn't over-fussed, with due respect, to American millionaires. And I thought, you know, that's strange. Fancy only America could produce a man who could make more than a million dollars out of selling turkeys. <laughs> but when she told me that he talked in tongues, I thought, what on earth has America produced? A tongue-talking turkey millionaire. <laughs> and I thought no more of it, excepting I went to visit with Paul in that far city. And I had a call from my wife, Pat, and she said, something strange has happened to Maria. And it transpired that Maria had gone into her room and read this book. Now, she was infant baptised in our church, confirmed at 12, and because we reap what we sow, because my life wasn't committed, her life wasn't. 
I went home and I read the book. It was called How to Receive the Baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I knelt down by my bed and asked God if he was real to show himself to me. And I had the most amazing sense of the power of God and just warmth and electricity just go right through my body. And I just felt words just flowing out from my mouth, just a, a strange language. And I just knew that God was real. So now she comes and tells her mother, who tells me all this. I hadn't got to report the vicar to the bishop. And here my own daughter was in this thing. My first reaction was hurt pride. I was shocked, hurt pride. My second reaction was fatherly concern. And I said, well, Pat, if Maria continues to act up strangely, just call the doctor. I mean, that's all I could think about. I didn't look forward to coming home. Another problem. Got home here, found Maria, smiling, loving, open, wanted to go to church. Oh, I thought I'll leave her alone. This, I've got enough problems already. And so she began to go to church regularly with us. But she started to do something which changed our lives. It was this. She began to pray for her mother and father. You know, when people pray for you, something happens. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand about spiritual powers you can't see. I didn't understand anything of the power of prayer. But she prayed for us for six months. And during that time, the relationship of Pat and myself got worse and worse and worse. Because the devil was happy with Bill Sabrisky sitting in church, doing nothing to disturb his kingdom. But when Bill Sabrisky looked like getting born again or some spiritual experience happening, the devil got really angry. So there was real frustration came into our marriage. It got worse and worse till six months later, we were really at the point of separation. Went into that same Anglican church, believe it or not, that same Anglican church came another man from England and they said when he prayed for the sick, they got healed. They invited me. I wasn't interested. Some of my wealthy clients began to ring me. I said, if he's all that good, take him down to the Auckland hospital, let him pray for all the sick, clean out the wards and save ourselves a lot of taxes. I mean, I just didn't believe anybody could heal a flea. Finally, on the Saturday night, one of my more impressive clients really pushed me to go. Sat there, listened to the man preach, good message, I thought. And then he began to pray for sick people. I knew dear old Mrs. Jones, who, whom he prayed for, I think that was her name, but I, she was an old client of mine. Yes, she was full of arthritis. I can remember her so well. Here, here's this man praying for her. When he put his hand on her, I thought he had hit her with an electric cattle prod. For suddenly she just jumped up, her hand straightened out, her leg straightened out, and she began to run. And clearly before my eyes she'd been healed. I mean, I knew that woman was healed. I couldn't deny it. And all in the name of Jesus Christ. So then he began to pray for some more people, and again I saw certain happenings which I clearly identified that these people had been healed. I mean, I could see something was going on in them. It startled me. Then he made a call for those who wanted to receive Jesus Christ as Saviour. Well, I knew that wasn't for me. I mean, I was on the vestry for 25 years. I was on the synod for 20 years. I was chairman of the stewardship council for 10 years. I was advisor to the bishop. I didn't need to do that, so I just dozed off. He finished his call. After some time, I waited impatiently for it to happen, but finally he finished and the meeting was over. After the meeting, Pat comes up to me and said, Bill, why don't we get our knees prayed for? Now, my knees and her knees had been a real problem because during snow skiing and water skiing would damage the cartilages. And I knew if the doctors got to me, I'd have a stiff leg for six months if they removed the cartilage. I knew this man had some power. I wanted to be healed but I didn't want anybody to see Bill Sabrisky getting prayed for. So I reluctantly agreed to be prayed for, but when everybody had gone home, two o'clock the next morning, the man finished praying for everybody, and we were the only ones left, the vicar, Pat, the preacher, and me. He walks up to me, looks me up and down, puts his hand out. Well, brother, what can I do for you? Brother, that expression, they didn't use it, you see, in my church, and I didn't like it. Anyway, I began to tell him my problem. And when you have a problem, well, you'll spend a lot of time on it. And uh, he listened patiently, told him about the problem in my knees. And then he sat, sat back or stood back and looked me up and down, said nothing for a few moments. And then he said, well, brother, 
if you spent more time on your knees, you would have less problems. I looked him up and down, I didn't say it, but I thought you cheeky palm. I mean, here's the man telling me I should be praying on my knees. And that's how I'd get my knees fixed. Anyway, I let him pray for me, and over the next two weeks the condition totally disappeared. Now that same man had been booked into my beach home. I didn't know it was going to be him when they asked me if this man could stay. I was president of a Rotary Club. I spoke at an adjacent Rotary Club near my beach home one night, uh, two, days, two nights later it was, and I decided to call in and see this man. There was something about him I liked. I mean, there was a glow, there was a joy, there was a peace, and he had power. And I knew it was, they were all things that I desired. So when I, when, he knocked, when I knocked on my beach home door on this beautiful summer's night, he responded and he was dressed in shorts. He didn't look like a preacher at all. He invited me into my beach home and then proceeded to tell me he'd sailed my little yacht and smashed its mast. Well, I still liked him. We had a cup of tea and I secretly decided to go and listen to him again. So I left there. But I wasn't going to tell Pat, you see, our relationship wasn't good enough to tell her anything like that. So ten days later, he's speaking in Hamilton, 80 miles away from here. So I have my dinner, and not much conversation, walk out to my car. I notice Pat walks out to hers, and she looks over to me and said, where are you going? Well, no harm in telling her, she won't know what I'm doing. I'm going to Hamilton, I said. Oh, she said, I'm going there too. Oh, well, the game was up, so we went together sat in the hall, the same performance. Some woman got up, a sister in the Hamilton Hospital, and explained how three days before she had a disease in her blood, the doctors now couldn't find it. This man had prayed for her. He preached very well, and then he came down and he prayed for some more sick people, and again I saw healings. In fact, there was a healing there I well remember to this moment, for I didn't understand that God told people, or told a preacher, about people in the crowd. And here it was, he said, there's a boy I believe in this crowd who has his arm broken, wrongly reset. If he'll come out, God will heal him. And sure enough, out rushes a boy, and he's right in front of my nose. And inches away from my nose, this preacher lays hands on this boy. I hear the bones crackle, the arms straighten, and the boy shouts, I'm healed, and runs back to his mother. Well, the man went up and finished preaching, and then he made one of these calls again for those who needed Jesus Christ in their life. Well, I knew that wasn't for me. I was chairman of the stewardship council. I was on the vestry. I was advisor to the bishop. I was on the synod. So I just dozed off. The meeting was over. I'm driving home, and then I had a real revelation, a real realization, it's like a flash of light. I realized that Pat had a problem, you see. I didn't have one, but Pat had a problem. Uh, the children had a problem, and this man might be able to fix it up. So I thought, I'll ask them to come tomorrow night. So I said to Pat, what about us going again tomorrow night? She said, well, fine. The children were all home. Paul, Paul was home from Dunedin and Jan. So we went down together. But this time I got there early and I sat right at the front of the meeting, just near the stairs that he'd walked down because I wanted to see how he did it. What was, what was the secret? Preached. Then down he came and he said, I believe there's a woman in this crowd tonight who has a lump in the center of her back. God's shown me this. Sure enough, out comes a lady, stands in front of me, see the lump, inches away from my nose. I saw him touching the lump. We could see it through the dress. And he said, in the name of Jesus, go. I couldn't believe it. His, the lump was gone. And there were other similar healings. He, my mind was exploding. He went back up, began to carry on preaching, and then made another one of these calls for people to ask Jesus Christ into their life, for them to be born again. But of course I knew it wasn't for me. I mean, I was chairman of the stewardship council of the diocese. I mean, I was a member of the synod. I was advisor to the bishop. And I'd been on the vestry for now well over 20 years. So I proceeded to doze off, accepting that this fellow, and I was quite angry, he seemed to know about a person like me. And I didn't know how. He seemed to know about a businessman, a lawyer who was in that audience, and who needed a lot of problems in his life and he needed to know Jesus. And I got quite angry that somebody had told him about my problems. <laughs> and then he went on and he went on and he went on and he went on and he went on. The Bible talks about persistence. This fellow was the most persistent fellow I'd ever heard. 
And I, as he went on, I got more and more uncomfortable for that same feeling was beginning to rise up in me that was in the Billy Graham meetings that I had. And I looked for a way of escape. On the right was my whole family. On the left were another crowd. I was in the middle of the row. I had no way of getting out. I determined to sit it out. And the fellow carried on. And he went on and on and on. And this feeling got stronger and stronger and stronger. And then I remembered that feeling of sadness I'd had when I'd gone out of those gates without making that commitment. I knew something was going to happen. I knew I couldn't resist what something, was, something that was happening in me, some response I didn't understand. And so when it became almost overwhelming, I looked around and made sure he was right, that he had every eye shut and every head bowed. <laughs> and when I was sure that was the case, I put my hand up and down like that. Well, it was so quick that I guess even the preacher didn't see it, but God saw it. And that's how I got saved, that little step. I noticed my family put their hands up afterwards. The meeting's over. Get up, walk to the end of the row, and Maria says, Dad, come and get baptised with the Holy Spirit. I said, not that tongues thing. Maria, Pat's standing there, and she said, Bill, why don't we try it? It was like a last straw. You know, let's try something. So reluctantly, I went to the back of that hall. About 60 people were there, mainly women folk. Here's the preacher coming along, laying hands on them, one by one, weeping, shouting, funny sounds. I wanted to run, but here I was sitting on this platform. I looked down, and here's Maria at the bottom of the row, or the bottom of the stairs, watching her father, waiting to see what happens. So I couldn't escape. The preacher's in front of me. My life seems to pass in a moment. He's laying hands on me. He says, be baptised, something like this. Brother, be baptised in the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth and speak out. And I opened my mouth and a flood came out. This whole language poured out. And I was startled. Well, he just jumped and he must have, I thought he must have touched that ceiling. Uh, he, he shouted the loudest hallelujah I've ever heard a man shout as though God had cracked the toughest nut in our country. Maria saw it all happen. The others of our family all received the experience that night, the same experience. I walked down, Maria says, Dad, you must feel different. Well, I was bewildered. I said, well, yes, Maria, yes. But I, I didn't know what had happened to me. Drove home, got home at midnight. Next morning, I'm up at six as usual. I pull home, open the curtains here in this house. Look out. We have large grounds here. I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen the grass that green. I looked at the trees. I'd never seen them that beautiful. I'd never heard the birds sing like that. I mean, I'd been here 10, 15 years. Never, something was different. Had breakfast, never said anything to the family. Got in my car, drove to the office. And as I drove and looked at the sky, I'd never seen it so blue. And then it happened. I realised the words my mother had quoted from Jesus. So often she'd said those words, except the man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of God or see the kingdom of God. I knew what had happened to me. I was born again. I was looking on the earth with new eyes as though I had just entered this earth. I had to tell somebody. So I parked the car, get into the elevator in the 12-storey building where we have our offices at the top, our legal offices, look around the elevator to tell somebody. I see a lawyer I know there. So I waited for everybody to get out. I knew he'd get out of the floor just below me. And as we approached that floor, I said, Ron, I want to tell you something. He knew me for years. He served on the church with me. I said, I've been born again and I speak in tongues. Well, you'd have thought I hit him with a sledgehammer. I mean, I thought he was going to fall over. He stepped out of that elevator looking backwards at me uh, as, he, as he walked away. I knew I hadn't made much headway, so I had to get up and into my legal office because now I could relate to Jesus Christ. He was real. He was alive. I could talk about him. Never been able to do that in my life. Never used the name of Jesus. Hadn't sworn. So never used his name before, except when I said it in a service called my legal partners into the office. I said, I want to tell you, I've been born again and I speak in tongues. I'm a born again Christian. I thought they'd be pleased. Instead of that, they looked at each other, went down the office and corridor and had a conference. I knew I hadn't made it, so I locked the office doors, got on my knees because now I could talk to Jesus Christ. He was real. He was a person I could relate to. I said, please, Jesus, do the same thing to my legal partners as you've done to me. And you better start on that Catholic one. He'll be the easiest. Well, Terry Way came to me 
about two weeks later, and he said, I've been invited to a Catholic charismatic, he couldn't say charismatic, I said, charismatic meeting. Yes, he said. I said, you go, do you good. Well, he went for six weeks, and one Friday I can still see him flying through the door. It was as though his feet were about a foot off the door. He rushed in and he hugged me. I mean, lawyers don't usually hug each other, do they? Anyway, he hugged me, and he shouted, I've got it, I've got it, and I knew what had happened. He was born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. So now there were two. And you see, the Bible says if any two agree as touching in on anything on earth, it happens in heaven. So we locked the doors, took hands together, and agreed for our main Anglican partner, who was another person like me, phlegmatic, hard to convince. He told me a while ago that he watched us for 18 months. He'd been our partner of mine for years, but he'd watched us for 18 months then after this experience, and he knew it was real finally. So he came to this very house one day. By then we'd started the pre-meeting in our home, and one night he got on his knees in front of the crowd, gave his life to Jesus Christ, was born again, baptized in the Spirit. So we had a Spirit-filled legal practice. And for about 14 years they've had a prayer meeting in that place nearly every morning. And I always say to people, it's dangerous to go there. If you want a divorce, you'll be prayed right out of it. Anyway, what happened in my family? Well, the first thing that happened my marriage with Pat was totally healed, or her marriage to me. You see, all the darkness went out and all the light came in. And for 15 years we've had a wonderful marriage, never a, a quarrel of any description, beautiful agreement in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then the miracle with Paul. So Dad invi invited me up from Dunedin where I was studying to attend a, um, an evangelist meeting. and. Uh, I had already begun to start to seek, um, you know, I felt there must be another um, or more in life than I had seen. I tried it through various ways. I tried uh, getting a purpose in my life through sport, through fast cars, fast women, things like that, and um, uh, there was no result. So I'd started looking, and at university also, one of the studies I was doing was in philosophy. And funnily enough, this, uh, the conclusions most of them came to was that there must be something out there which I termed God. And uh, this started the, the search. And the weekend that I was invited up, I was um, at the time at university playing social rugby. And uh, I had a leg injury, which meant that I, wouldn't, I had to miss the game anyway. So I went up north and during the meeting, um, which was a healing meeting. They called for uh, prayer, uh, or they decided to pray for people with injuries. And uh, I stood for prayer for my leg, and uh, I was barely able to hobble into the meeting. I was able to sprint out, and I thought, well, here's something I can't really, uh, can't really understand. So uh, uh, it was at the uh, same meeting that um, uh, Dad made a commitment, and uh, I made a commitment also, but probably for a different reason. We got there at the same time, by coincidence. That same night, the spirit that had entered him, and it was a demon, a, a spirit being without a body, had entered him in that beach home, and for nine years had taken over his personality, had pushed his personality, the real Paul, to one side, and I'd been dealing with this thing, and I never understood it because I never understood spiritual powers, and a demonic force had occupied him. Now, when he gave his life to Jesus, was baptized in the Spirit, he changed in an instant. When I returned to Dunedin, I was only up there for the night, um, the Lord impressed upon me very strongly that my father could be taken that night immediately. And um, I had almost like a flash back that you get, of all the incidents when I knew that my father cared for me but couldn't communicate uh, that caring or didn't have time to, and I felt obliged to put that right, to just basically tell my father that yes, I loved him and uh, um, you know that I recognised a lot of the problem, problems were mine. And uh, so I wrote a letter to my father, I felt um, that urgency to do that. and. Uh, he received that, and I guess since that time, um, we've had a tremendous relationship. And I found I had the same boy back, the boy I knew for the first nine years of his life. Gentle, sweet type of personality. 
married a lovely Christian girl, they have lovely children now. Yes, my parents especially seemed a lot closer to each other and my father was a lot more approachable and much more open towards us and I felt, I felt closer to them too. I want to conclude by bringing my entire family up and they're just up here now and I just want to introduce them for a moment to tell you how real it all is. Here's my wife Pat coming now and I just praise God for Pat. My daughter Maria, she married a Baptist. We didn't care for Baptists. We grew to love them. We forgave her for that. And here she is married to a Baptist. You see, Maria's prayers joined with those of my mother in heaven. And then here's Paul. And you've got a rebellious son. Look at Paul, a changed person. With his with his dear wife Lynette, I may say that every one of our family are engaged in some form of Christian ministry. And finally, my daughter Jan. Well, Jan married a man who came from a long distance from Hungary. I wasn't too shook on foreigners, but God gave me a real love for Colin. And so here's Colin, her husband and daughter Jan. And finally, Here's young John, he preached with us in India. But I just would like to introduce you to John. He was the baby of the family. <laughs> Praise God. God spoke to Pat and I at the same time after our baptism in the Spirit to open a prayer meeting in our home. And we invited a few people in. Well, the neighbours soon heard about this conversion experience. I mean, this place used to be used for big parties. And when they ran up till three in the morning, we got, we got phone calls from every, everywhere around us objecting to the noise and so forth because they were pretty good parties. Now we were having prayer meetings and many neighbours came in to see what had happened. And many went out born again of the Spirit of God in this very lounge over a period of eight years I think I would be telling the tr absolute truth before God. Many thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ. In this very room, as we began to pray for the sick, we had tremendous testimonies of healing. Grant's sickness began in August of 83 when we were in Palmerston North on holiday. We were staying with my parents and Grant seemed to have some sort of flu virus but he deteriorated quite badly and by seven o'clock at night we were quite worried about him. He was admitted to Princess Mary Hospital in Auckland where they observed him for a while to see if there was anything more they could do. Uh, there just seemed to be no answer to it. He was given the uh, label of his sickness as ankylosing spondylitis. The pain was something you probably never experienced before. Um, it, it was kind of a stabbing in the back of your back, it just clenched, it was on for sometimes three hours, it could be ten minutes, you know, it could be ten minutes apart or three hours apart. I didn't know really what time it was going to come on or not, it was really weird. Um, I remember one night that we actually got him home from hospital overnight and he desperately needed a bath and we put him in the bath and we washed his hair. And just the incredible movement then, trying to be gentle with him, put him into a pain spasm for, it seemed, hours. After about two hours, we realised that he seemed to be getting worse. And so we phoned the emergency doctor that was on in our area, and he came and he was at our place for nearly two hours from 10 o'clock at night onwards. And he tried all sorts of treatment on her. He tried to stretch him when he, to, to relieve the pain. We put ice packs on him. We put heat on him. And he just stood there and he had tears in his eyes and he was a, a, a doctor who would have been probably in his 50s. And he just had tears in his eyes. He just couldn't, couldn't stand the look of him. And the same useless feeling, you can't do a thing for him. Mm. With being on so much medication, the aspirin really deteriorates your kidneys. And this was one of the main things that our doctor was worried about because 
the amount that he was having, he was having 3,000 milligrams of aspirin a day, which is quite a hefty dose for an 11-year-old child. Children of this age, they told me, just do not get this disease. The kidneys would have deteriorated at that point. They were deteriorating, yes. Um, no test was done at that stage to find out just how far they had gone, but, you know, th there was, we were told that the, the kidneys would deteriorate and therefore would affect his general health, therefore would it affect his length of life. And this really worried us, that here you've got this child that's virtually dying before your eyes and you're feeding him more drugs to help it on its way. It's, you know, it was, it was really, really frustrating. It was horrible. Life just seemed to be just terrible. It was like living in a big dark tunnel and there just didn't seem any end to it. Uh, when Grant had got to the stage in hospital where they wanted to call in another specialist, we had a little bit of conflict between the rheumatologist and the orthopaedic surgeon. The orthopaedic surgeon decided that he wanted to put Grant in a plaster cast from under his armpits to the tops of his legs. The reason for this was he felt that if he immobilised him and there was no movement, we could then reduce the pain and then reduce the painkillers. The morning he went into a plaster cast, he was taken down to the plaster room and my husband and I were sitting outside the uh, room where he was having the plaster put on. And because Grant was having great difficulty standing, they sort of swung him from a T-bar so that they would stretch him as far as they could. And then they put this plaster on and we were sitting out in the hallway and could just sort of hear what was going on. And then all of a sudden we heard, get it off and fast. And Grant had gone into shock and just couldn't cope with it. You can't cough in a plaster cast. You can't take a deep breath. You can only just do a normal shallow breathing and clear your throat. And Grant found it just, just too claustrophobic. Once the plaster cast didn't work, they really had nothing else for us at that stage. Uh, the next diagnosis was that they would just put him in hospital and put him on a, a heavier painkiller, which would be monitored. But they just said, we just don't know what will happen to him. I went home and took Grant, I took Grant home with me because I didn't want to leave him in hospital that day. He was just absolutely terrified. The look on his face was like somebody who had been tortured. And I just really felt really bad about having taken him there. And I remember when I got home that afternoon, I really cried out to God and said, look, you've got to show me what to do. I just, you know, you can't let this go on. And I really, really let him know that I needed something. And it kept coming back to me quite almost audibly. Ring Bill Sabritsky. Why don't you ring? And I kept saying, look, there's got to be something else. I don't have to do that. But this just kept coming back and back and back. Grant, God's going to heal you today. His healing power's on your body now. Now, begin to rise. In Jesus' name, begin to rise out of your chair. Out you come. Stand, stand up. Take a... That's right. That's right. Take a step. Begin to take a step. That's right. Walk. 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 That. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. I'm going to anoint you. You'll be all right. I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God's healing powers on your body. Up you come. Come up. Come up. God's healed you. You are healed. Begin to rise. That's it. You'll be all right. Stand up. That's right. Stand. Now begin to walk. God's healed you. You'll find you're healed. Look. You're healed. God's totally healed you. You're okay. Look. You're all healed. Okay. And then when Bill got him to stand again after praying and anointing him, I was just really stunned. And when Bill opened his office door and told him to go for a walk, I thought that was wonderful. I was quite happy if God had stopped at that point. But then Bill said to me, would you like to be able to, uh, said to Grant, would you like to be able to run? And I thought, well, when he gets stronger, he will be able to run. And Bill opened the office door again and said, go for a run. And I just, I was just completely dissolved in tears and it was just too much for me. And it, to see Grant just absolutely running along the hallway and back again was just, just amazing. It was something I never ever believed would ever happen. He was due to go back into hospital that afternoon so I went to the, doc, the specialist rooms and when we arrived there he was standing outside and the look on his face was amazing because 
You could almost see his mind turning over. Here was this woman this morning in tears because the plaster hadn't worked and there was no hope for anything else that they could do for him. And yet here he was walking along the pavement just like any normal child. And, you know, it was just really incredible. And when we told him exactly what had happened, he just put his hand on Grant's back and he said to him, well, good one, Grant, go and enjoy your life now. Um, when we took him back to school, the school teacher was really amazed. He had spent a lot of time with Grant trying to keep him at school. He just couldn't believe it. He just shook his head and he said, well, I've got a sheepskin for his chair. And I said, no, he doesn't need one. He's well. And he said, well, we'll just take it easy. I said, no, he's to do sport. He's to do everything. By then, I knew that God had healed him and I knew that his healing was total and that we didn't have to nurse him anymore. And uh, I remember him saying, well, well, just give me a week to think about this. It was just a bit much. I know the peace that God can bring in a family. I know how he can restore a family. And even my dear old dad was born again at the age of 77, had a miraculous healing. He was unconscious for eight weeks after an operation. I prayed for him every day, went and visited him every day. He gabbled. His doctors would say he'll never survive. He'll die. Every day they told me he would die. Finally, one day God spoke to me as I walked into that ward, just as I approached it in Middlemore Hospital, Auckland. He said, I've healed your dad. And the doctor took me in and my dad was sitting in a chair, absolutely healed. He jumped to his feet. I said to the doctor, what did you do? He said, we took every tube out of his body and expected him to die. And he was absolutely healed. My dad lived another seven years till 84 in the joy of the Lord and went to be with the Lord just last year. You see, God changes everybody and everything if we let him. I'd never want to go back to where I was 15 years ago because I know reality, I know the presence of Jesus Christ, I know the peace that God can bring in the family. And I would just finally say that if people have a problem in their home and in their marriage, is Jesus Christ the head of the family? If he is, the problems will disappear. There will be still some problems, of course, but the basic problems will disappear because the love of God encompasses everything. Well, I hope you have enjoyed watching that video. While it was being played, I'm sure the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you already know him as your personal saviour. But if you do not, you can know him right now. All you need to do is to turn from those things that have held you back from God. Maybe it's been unforgiveness, doubt, fear, maybe even things of the occult. But if you are prepared to renounce all sin, maybe even sexual sin, whatever it is, if you renounce that right now and ask Jesus Christ into your life, he will come in. You will know his presence. You will know this new birth that we've been speaking about. You will know the power of God in your life. May I lead you in a simple prayer right now? I will close my eyes and say the phrases one at a time so that you have, may have a chance to follow. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ came into this world born of a virgin. I believe that they hung him on a cross. I believe he died in my place and carried the penalty for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead on the third day. I believe Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. I turn to you, Lord Jesus. I renounce all sin. I ask you into my life. Come, Holy Spirit. I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of salvation, of eternal life, which you have freely given me. Amen. Now, if you have said those words with belief, the Bible says that you are saved, you have salvation. 
If you have never been water baptized in any form, you should get water baptized as soon as possible. Join a believing church, a church that loves Jesus Christ and believes the word of God. And I know God will richly bless you. God bless you.